you've heard, of course, of the Jesus Prayer yeah. in the Eastern Christianity. Um, Thomas Aquinas addresses the issue in the Summa as to whether we should pray at all times. And mm. he said, in one sense, yes, and in one sense, no. Right. In one sense, no, because you have obligations of to course. fulfill. You can't be praying at all times. But he quotes Augustine in saying that we can pray at all times by desire. Yes, exactly. What does he mean by that? He, before Freud, understood the power of the subconscious. Uh, desires aren't always conscious. Desires mm. are also subconscious. And the subconscious ones come from the depths of the heart. They're mm. the deepest desires of all. And if your deepest desire is to do God's will, you're going to go to heaven, no matter how badly you, you, you act on that desire. It might be, take a lot of purgatory, but uh, yeah. it, it's what Karl Rahner calls the, your fundamental option. You're not consciously aware of that at all times. The mm -hmm. reason you have to keep going back to formal prayer is to, to mm -hmm. remember that, mm -hmm. uh, to get the rust off it. But it's there all the time. Mm. What, do, what do we do then with those desires that come up that that make us afraid, like sexual desires or mm. desires to hurt people or desires for money, any sort of wicked desire that we're very ashamed of. Mm. Um, we don't bring it to other people because we're afraid if they mm. knew that about us, they wouldn't like us. But as mm. you say there, those subconscious desires are speaking to us. Well, the more hidden and subconscious they are, the more dangerous they are because they're not in the lights. So the first thing yeah. you have to do is, is bring them to the light, be honest. Mm. Uh, Sometimes we treat God in the same way that we treat other people. We're afraid of him, and we're afraid to confess these things, mm -hmm. and we're afraid to deal with them. Uh, and even if you deal with them badly, just that you're dealing with them in the presence of God helps. And even if he doesn't give you the, uh, the answer that you want, you know that your honest bringing this into God's presence is going to make a difference. And... If he doesn't heal those desires and you're still bothered by them, mm -hmm. that's his will too. Mm. Thomas Aquinas says God's like a doctor. He'll sometimes deliberately not heal a certain disease because he knows that if he does, more harm is going to come. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Especially pride. Yeah, it reminds me of Paul talking about that, what Thorn does he call it? Flesh. Thorn in the flesh. And we've yeah. all speculated as to what that could possibly mean. But this idea that pride is the worst sin. Yeah. We don't think that, a lot of us. Deep down, we, we don't, no. Although That's when we see it in others, we hate it more than any other sin. Yeah, yeah. So if my friend is lustful, I feel sorry for him, yeah. maybe. This is, if he's prideful, I find that the most disgusting. A lot of us confuse pride with vanity. You know, look into a mirror and say how beautiful I am. Well, that's a fault. That's, that's not pride. Yeah. Pride is, I want to play God. Yeah. Uh, my will be done, not yours. I want to instrumentalize God. I want to use him to gratify my desires, which I'm, which I'm identifying with. You don't do that. You have to give him everything. How do you know if you're prideful? You don't. That's what's so tough, right? You don't. It doesn't matter. Uh, th that's, that's a trap the devil likes to get us into. Let's see. What's going on in me? Yeah. Uh, how, can I, how can I deal with that? Yeah. Uh, is, is, is this bad me or is this good me, the real me? Uh, that, that, that leads nowhere. Stop look. That's I the problem. Stop looking out. Is that the answer? Hey, if if you're in the presence of somebody that's much more beautiful than you and much wiser than you and much better than you, Regularly. do you want to talk about yourself? Yeah. Or do you want to forget yourself? Yeah. Because this is the thing. I mean, you meet people and you think, this person is extraordinarily arrogant. And they don't know that about themselves. Uh, I've but, met then, but, then like you, that. but then you think, well, if they don't know that about them, what don't I know about me? <laughs> touche, yeah. touche. Yeah. That's the helpful thing about having a wife. My wife's always willing to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is one, why one of the best things that happened to C.S. Lewis was his marriage to Joy Davidman, mm. who was not a sweet, nice, beautiful wife, yes. but she was wonderfully honest, and he exposed, she exposed his baloney, and he loved her for it. Really? You know what's fascinating is when, you know, we talk about the problem of evil and how we have a pastoral approach and a, and a kind of philosophical approach. When you put side by side the problem of evil with, uh, what was the book he wrote after the death of his wife? A Grief Observed. A Grief Observed. You see the difference. I mean. The wonderful honesty in that book. Oh. That, is, that is the best book I know to give to someone who's grieving. Do you know the story of, uh, he, he wrote that as a, under a pen name? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I was told that people kept giving it to him. Did you tell me that? You told me that, Mac. Yeah. Yeah, people kept giving it to him. Like, all right, I'll just come back. But that first line, nobody told me fear felt so much. What did he say? No one told me grief felt so much like fear. I keep swallowing, something like that. Yeah. 
and he goes to all these places, uh, and they're not the same. Nothing's the same mm -hmm. without her. How, how how could the death of one person be like the sky spread over everything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea that Beautiful. if I travel to all the planets throughout all of space, I'll never I see never her face, see her. Yeah. hear her voice. Wonderfully honest. I, I was weeping after reading that first page. It just really broke me. And there's one line in that book, which is the fundamental solution practically to the problem of evil. Uh, is it conceivable that a loving God should give us such pains and such griefs? Well, if we don't need them, he's not a loving God. Mm. And if he is, we need them. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Everything we get, all the sufferings we get, we need. Which is so hard to believe when you consider how much certain people go through. Yeah. It's a bloody difficult problem. It is. It is. It's not and meant to be easy. It's interesting when you look at the Sumer, Aquinas sometimes puts 12 or 13, or if you read De Malo, his other work, he'll have like 24 objections. Yeah. And here he has two to, the two to the existence of God. Yep, only two. And the big one is the problem of evil. And the other one isn't really a conclusive proof that God doesn't exist. No, it's more no. just God Apparently of the gaps, science sort of. can explain yeah. everything, but who knows? Yeah. yeah. What do you think the best, so what do you think the best argument for atheism is? Problem of evil, certainly. Yeah. How can I trust a God who lets such, such horrible things happen? Yeah. And not just to us, but to animals. Of course. Why do animals need it? They don't need it. There's no clear answer to that question. There you go. Yeah. We're, we're told what we need to know, and we're only given hints about the animals. And I think Lewis's chapter in The Problem of Pain about animal suffering is the best answer. Huh. Their answer has something to do with our answer. They're not to be understood in themselves, but in their relation to us. They're mm. parts of our family. Mm. He, he goes so far as to say that the pet is the more, more truly natural animal than the wild animal. Hmm. Because if God made everything for us, he made animals for us. Mm -hmm. So the most important animals are cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. And the least important animals are the ones that can't be tamed. Cats, I would have thought. No, I guess they no, use litter boxes. Cats. But they'd be doing that whether they had us or not, if they had a litter box. Well, dogs have the problem of despair and cats <laughs> have the problem of pride. They're equal. When I grew up, I thought dog, old dogs were boys and old cats were girls. Everybody thinks that. Yeah. I wonder why. Do you remember misconceptions you had as a kid I'll offer one just to kind of oh, show yes. you what I mean. When I was a kid, I thought allergic meant afraid of. So I remember going to the doctor and they'd say, are you allergic to anything? And I'd say, yeah, those big moths with the eyes on the back. <laughs> <laughs> My mum when she's angry. No, but yeah, I don't remember saying that. So what are some misconceptions you had? I remember reading a book, no, listening to a sermon, which called God the Supreme Being. And I thought it was a supreme bean and I didn't like beans. <laughs> <laughs> you felt guilty. Yes. So that's hilarious. My friend, John, Father John Park, said he grew up by a car yard, a sales lot, you know, and it would have the number of the year the car was made, so 82, 97, whatever, and he would drive past and think, ugh, only parents are so stupid that they would pay $97 for a car. <laughs> you know how many, much candy you could buy for that? <laughs> yeah. So why you said it was when you were at, your college, Calvin College, mm -hmm. you decided to be a philosopher. Yeah. Did you have any inklings towards it prior to then? No. I write a lot of poetry in, uh, in high school, yeah. and I wanted to become a writer. I thought I wanted to become a poet. I was an English major. Yeah. Uh, and the first philosophy course I ever taught was taught by somebody who was probably certifiably insane. Yeah, why do you say that? He would put his chair on the desk and say, I am the king, and this is my kingdom, and you are my subjects. Ah. Uh, <laughs> And he would uh, march up and down the aisles and point uh, at our heads and say, it's there, but it's not there. Uh, but you remember him. Oh, yes. <laughs> he was so absent-minded that he was constantly going uh, across the street, uh, reading a book and getting hit by cars. No. He was in the hospital a few times. You're joking. I'm not joking. So was he bright or just stupid? Both. Both, yeah. Both. Anyway, uh, the chairman of the department, uh, William Harry Jellema, who was probably the best philosopher I ever met, mm. uh, said to me uh, when I said I don't want to take any more philosophy courses, he said, uh, you probably took Dr. Runner. Ah. I said, yes. He said, give, give somebody else a chance. So I did. And I gave Jellema a chance and he was great. I took about six of his courses. Uh, most, I think, of our, our vocational choices are, are due to models. We see somebody who's, who's successful in the field. I want to be like that. Mm. And when you started studying in your undergrad, I imagine, is that what you mean, philosophy? Yeah. In your did you know you wanted to go on to do a PhD in it? Yes, I did. Yep. 
Uh, I thought of going to seminary. Uh, and at Yale, I thought of becoming a Dominican. Wow. Uh, and I worked my way through that, and I concluded that, well, I want it all. You know, uh, me too. I want to be the other kind of father. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. So did you go stay with the Dominicans? Uh, I had some Dominican teachers. Uh, at Calvin, actually, I went to Aquinas College, which is also in Grand Rapids, mm -hmm. and took a course from a Dominican. Yeah. I didn't understand Aquinas very well at the time, but yeah. I respected the teacher. He was a very wise and holy man. Yeah. I love the Dominicans. I do, too. Uh, Father Thomas Joseph White is a brilliant man. He just wrote a book on Catholicism. I forget the name of it, but it was excellent. Um, yeah, I discerned with the Franciscans. Mm -hmm. I think I like the idea. I like the idea of being a Dominican, but I think I'm a Franciscan at heart. Father Groeschel type. Yeah. He's wonderful. I'm just Yo, thanks for watching. You can watch the entire episode on YouTube if you want. You can listen to it at The Matt Frad Show by subscribing on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And feel free to support me, patreon.com slash mattfrad.